Well, good evening. Welcome to Saving Grace Bible Church. So many wonderful things happening today and tonight. The thrill of opening up God's Word together and uh, taking the time of communion. We actually, uh, this week, worked on some lighting. So if uh, the sanctuary turns into like a disco ball, it's because we didn't work out the bugs yet. So we, hopefully we will have all of that. But it's just a, a thrill for us to come together to reflect on God's work and particularly the sending of Christ and then uh, take a time in which we can come around the Lord's table and, and confess our sins and rejoice in what Christ has done for us as he laid down his life on behalf of us, that we would have the hope of eternal life in Christ. And tonight and on Sunday morning, we're going to look at the gospel and reflect on the significance of the gospel for us and understand what it is. Ask the question, what is the gospel? And then answer that from Second Corinthians. So let's begin by word of prayer. Please stand with me. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of coming and worshiping. We just pray tonight as we come before you and we come to just quiet our hearts and to reflect on the glory of Christ and to reflect on your word, we pray, forgive us our sins. All those times in which we were self-willed and self-seeking, all those times in which we delighted in the flesh rather than walking in the spirit, we bring those before you and cast them at your feet and say, forgive us, that we would be free from the guilt of sin and be able to boldly come into your presence as we are in Christ Jesus. We rejoice that Christ is, when he went to the cross, took all of our sins upon himself All of our sins that we would ever commit, past, present, and future, are laid upon Him that we would then receive His righteousness. So as we come and reflect on these truths, open our minds to understand the depths of Your Word. Open our minds to understand why this was necessary. Open our minds to know the significance of these events, the events that led ultimately to Christ laying down His life on behalf of us. Unite our hearts together in love as we uh, reflect on our common unity in Christ. Unite our hearts to love one another so that we recognize uh, and show to the world that your love is within us. And ultimately give us uh, a gratitude for one another and give us a gratitude for you and for what you've accomplished on our behalf. Fill our hearts tonight as we sing, as we hear your word, and as we encourage one another. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
tonight we get to basically take some time to remember not only the events that led up to Jesus laying down his life for us, but also to reflect on what is the gospel. It's interesting as I think about the question, what is the gospel? It's almost every time we walk into a Christian bookstore, there's a new book, the gospel, what is it? And a, an attempt to answer the question, what is the gospel? There is, a, in one sense, there's never been a time like this in all of Christian history. There's never been a time with the kind of technology that we have and the access that we have to material than this time. You can open up a, a Bible program, Bible Works, Logos, and you can search original manuscripts, well, at least copies of the original manuscripts. You can investigate church history. It's all really at the, your fingertips. You can search the internet, and there are websites dedicated to uh, resources on understanding church history, theology, and the Word of God. And there are being... Uh, each and every year, more and more material is being republished so that we can investigate what the church has taught throughout all of church history. And yet, in the midst of all of that, there seems to be today more and more confusion about what is the gospel. People are asking today, what is it? And, and, and it depends on your flavor of theology, you get a different answer. One flavor of theology emphasizes a message that God does everything for you. You now just have to activate it and make it work. Another theology emphasizes the fact that God has come and has rescued and has brought people unto himself. And as we begin to look and evaluate what message truly reflects the gospel taught in the word of God, we are left kind of shaking our heads. Which teacher do I follow? Which Truth is accurate. What best reflects the word of God in regards to what the gospel message is? Over and over again throughout, uh, if you were to read various books, you would recognize there's an Arminian flavor of the gospel. And in that Arminian flavor of the gospel, God does everything. He lays out all the pieces. He's activated. He's covered all sin. And now we just have to act. There's a Calvinistic version that says we go out as God's servants proclaiming his word and God transforms people and adds to his kingdom. You can find a Methodist version and on and on the versions go to ultimately answer the question, what is the gospel? Are we saved from the wrath of God? Are we saved to have a better view of God? Are we saved so that God can have glory in us? Or how and why are we saved? Are we saved so that we can enjoy God, or are we saved so that God can enjoy us? These are the questions that are pondered and asked all the time, and these questions go on and on, and ultimately we want to know what does the Bible say about salvation and the gospel. And that's what I want to focus our attention on tonight. I want to answer what is the gospel as it was proclaimed by the apostles, because ultimately that's what we want to proclaim, right? We want to proclaim the gospel that the apostles preached. Otherwise, we're proclaiming our own message. And what we find in our text will be tonight, 2 Corinthians, basically the whole of chapter 5. So I can demonstrate to you, I can do a whole chapter. We'll do all of chapter 5, and then on Sunday morning, we'll look at just verse 21. And what we find in the book of 2 Corinthians is the gospel, and we find a, an important doctrine, the doctrine of justification. It's in this doctrine, in the doctrine of justification, that we find the very heart of the gospel. We find the very lifeblood by which the gospel finds its hope, finds its power, finds its significance. It's this justification that sinners can be justified before God. This doctrine of justification is ultimately what gives us hope, what gives us encouragement. The doctrine of justification was well, for Luther and the reformers, the doctrine by which the church either stood or fell. If you get the doctrine of justification wrong, well, then the whole church is off base and lost. And I agree with the reformers in that. I agree wholeheartedly. 
that the doctrine of justification is absolutely critical to our understanding of what is the gospel and ultimately to our understanding of salvation. If we get the doctrine of justification wrong, we get the doctrine of salvation wrong. If we get the doctrine of salvation wrong, well then, of course, we have eternal life wrong. The doctrine of justification, just to kind of define well, what is justification, It describes a divine courtroom by which in that courtroom a holy and righteous God declares Christ guilty by having our sins accounted to him and he declares us righteous by having Christ's righteousness attributed to us. That in in essence is what the doctrine of justification is. That sinners can stand justified before God because they're cloaked in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, friends, in a nutshell, is the heart of the gospel by which we believe. It is ultimately the events of this Good Friday, the events that Christ went to the cross, that makes this all possible. If Christ did not go to the cross and if he wasn't resurrected, there is no justification If he didn't die on our behalf, if he didn't bear our sins, there could be no justification. The doctrine of justification then is the high point of all of redemptive history. The events of the cross and the events three days later when Christ was resurrected, that is the high point of all of redemptive history. If we miss that event, we miss then all the reason why Christ came into this world and ultimately we miss the significance of his death. The doctrine of justification is the explanation for why Jesus had to be born into this world as a man and yet be fully God. Doctrine of justification explains that tension. Why did he have to be God, very God, and at the same time fully man? If he wasn't a man, he couldn't die on our behalf. If he wasn't God, fully God, then he couldn't bear the sins of all of his people. He can only cover himself. He had to be God, very God, to be able to take away the sins of his people. And he had to be a man that he could be the perfect sacrifice. That is caught up and explained in the doctrine of justification. The doctrine of justification is the reason why Christ had to come and live in a perfect life. Like he couldn't come in and just have one redemptive weekend where he came out of heaven on Wednesday, was arrested or had, to, you know, you know, had a, his final supper with the disciples on Thursday, arrested that night, you know, crucified the next day, three days later resurrected and then went back to heaven. It couldn't happen that way because he needed to live a perfect life. And doctrine of justification helps us understand that. The doctrine of justification as well helps us to vindicate the character of God. How is it that a just God who could look upon sinners and declare them righteous and holy and able to be in their presence without the doctrine of justification, a righteous God couldn't do that. The doctrine of justification as well is the explanation of how God could be both merciful and just. How is it that he can be merciful when his justice demands that he punish sin and yet how can he also punish sin and still be merciful to those who are sinners that's the doctrine of justification explains that tension the doctrine of justification as well is the difference between salvation by works and the salvation by grace alone the doctrine of justification as well was the very first theological debate in the church Open up the book of Galatians and start reading and you understand those who changed the gospel. Go to Acts chapter 15 and you see the first Jerusalem council and the debate on, on what is salvation and how one is saved. The doctrine of justification then was the very first doctrine that the church wrestled with to understand. That's to show us over again how important the gospel is. As well, it is the doctrine of justification that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world, for it is the only religion, the the religion of Christianity, that God rescues sinners. In every other religion, there is an attempt of sinners to try to be reconciled unto an indifferent God, but in Christianity, there's a God who seeks sinners. And, if that's not enough, the doctrine of justification is the non-negotiable doctrine that is at the core of the Christian faith. If you get that doctrine wrong, you get your entire faith wrong. This is absolutely critical for us to understand. To depart from the doctrine of justification is to jump into heresy. Just go read the Reformers. 
Read what happened between the reformers and the Catholic Church. Read the debates that went back and forth. Read the anathemas that went back and forth because they disagreed on this and you understand the significance of these events. Particularly, it's highlighted just by Paul's words. If you looked at Galatians chapter 1, just real quick. Paul makes this clear in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 8, he says this, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. He says, look, if anyone comes along and is going to teach something different from what I've taught to you, what I have proclaimed, whether it's us or another angel, if we've done something different, if we preach something different than what you have heard from us, they are to be accursed. So then there really is one answer for us. If we're going to understand the doctrine of justification, we're ultimately having to ask the question, Paul, what did you teach about justification? What did you teach about the gospel? You and the other apostles. And I can say this, it isn't an overstatement to say that this is the most important doctrine. I know at times preachers kind of have some sanctified liberty to exaggerate, I guess. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, whenever he preached, he would start off his sermon saying, this is the most important passage in all the New Testament. And then the next week he would repeat the same statement. Well, there is a sense that uh, this is the most important doctrine. And I'm convinced that to this point, and maybe next week I'll preach on the holiness of God and say that's the most important. But the fact is, this is the most important that Saving Grace Bible Church needs to understand. Because as Paul says this, you know these famous words of his in Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It is the gospel that saves. It is the gospel that gives to us righteousness. It is the gospel that is revealed from faith to faith. So it is the gospel then that we turn our attention to tonight so that we would understand what it is that God uses to save us. Now, just to kind of give you a little insight, like why did I pick this subject at this time? The Lord has been pressing me in in a few different ways over the last month or two as I've had various conversations. And as I've been thinking about the gospel, I've talked to various folks and, and seen that there's just a lot of confusion about what is the gospel, you would seem to think it would be this is a simple issue. This is a this is like a softball understanding, but it really is not. And I guess I again am not surprised because of the number of books out there, the number of ideas that are out there, plus the, the various agendas that have surrounded the church, we have drifted from understanding what the gospel is. And I wanted to bring some clarification to this. Because it is no surprise that Satan would want to bring confusion about the gospel. Because if he can confuse people, he can lead people from being saved. And it really doesn't matter for Satan. He doesn't matter if you're a liberal and you believe a liberal doctrine, if you're conservative and believe a conservative doctrine, as long as you don't believe a biblical doctrine. He doesn't care. You can be liberal or conservative, just don't believe the Bible. And so our hope tonight is just to get back to what the scriptures say to understand what is the word of God say about salvation And I also remember the words of a favorite professor of mine in college who used to say to me, Mark, truth is the fine edge of a sword, and you can fall off on either side. That's true. It is very hard to walk the narrow line of truth. It's very hard to walk down and be precise, but I hope this this is what we will do, walk precisely through this doctrine of justification. Now, I've had a few conversations And uh, some of you may say, hey, you're talking about me. I probably am, but I'm not trying to. I just want to actually reflect on on historically a couple of different doctrines that are confusions of the gospel, just so you understand the various confusions out there. The first person and the first kind of doctrinal idea that's out there that I interacted with is that which we can call historically easy believism. 
It is the belief that ultimately we're saved simply by a profession of faith that just says, I believe God. I believe that he's there. I believe that he is a savior. I believe that he has died for my sins. And because I believe that and repentance being described as a change of mind, I change my mind about God. I must be saved. So I used to view God as my enemy, but now I view him as my friend. I view him as one who came to rescue me. I don't view him as somebody I hate anymore, but somebody I love, and therefore I'm saved. So that if I can be sitting maybe in a sanctuary and I hear a message I like about Jesus and I believe that God's a pretty good guy and he likes me and he's given me eternal life, then I believe and I raise my hand and I tell everyone I believe and I'm saved. And I walk out there and you're eternally saved because you raised your hand or you changed your mind about Jesus. This is the doctrine of easy believism. It ultimately says that you can be saved without any kind of life transformation at all. It's just a change of mind, a change of heart about God. And they would express their, again, their newfound faith by walking forward. They would express their newfound faith by praying a prayer with their pastor or somebody else. They would raise their hand in affirmation that they love Jesus, and that is it. They may then just leave the church, go home, open up a beer, and continue on in life as they did before. But now they're saved because they made some kind of profession of faith and they changed their mind about God. This is the doctrine of easy believism. On the other hand, there is another doctrine, a doctrine that was predominantly taught by the Catholic Church, but there is manifested some in the evangelical church. And we'll call this the doctrine of mortal sin or the Catholic doctrine, and it is this. They would ultimately say that man is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, but we are justified at that time we are saved, but we continue to be justified as we continue to add our works to God's works. And if we continue to obey for the rest of our life, then we would be saved. But if in the process of obeying, we stopped obeying and we sinned and we died in that sin, well, we would lose eternal life because we shrunk away from God, because we turned away from him. We believed and we repented and repented means we turned away from sin and we started following God. But if at any point in time we stopped repenting, if at any point in time we stopped following after God, we and died at that moment, then we would go to hell. This would be the Catholic doctrine, the doctrine of mortal sin. And it's interesting, as I talked with various people, whenever I talked to the easy believism person, they thought I was defending the Catholic doctrine of losing your salvation. Then whenever I talked to the Catholic, he thought I was referring to the easy believism. And I felt pretty comfortable because truth is right in the middle. The point is this. That when God saves us, he saves us and he transforms us from within. And he, when he transforms us, he makes us different. We're so transformed and so made new that we are going to be different because we're in Christ Jesus. We're going to be set free from the bondage of sin and we're going to have a new life. We're not fearing sin because sin can no longer separate us from God. We're not fearing the difficulties of this world because God who saved us will deliver us. But yet at the same time, we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And at the same time, we are working to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time that we are justified, we are striving in our sanctification. I just want to show you this by helping you understand then what the heart of the gospel is. Because both of these views, the easy believism view and the mortal sin view or the Catholic doctrine view, both of them misunderstand what the gospel is. So what is the gospel? All right. All that to set up this question, what is the gospel? Let's just start with Peter's words and then we're going to finish up with Paul's. Notice Peter in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. Notice this wonderful truth. 1 Peter 3.18, Peter says this. And we can just basically boil down the gospel to this idea. The great exchange. The great exchange. We exchange our sin for Christ's righteousness. Christ exchanges righteousness for our sins. That's the great exchange. 
Notice how Peter says it in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also died for sins once for all. Notice this phrase, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring to us, to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Notice the riches of what Peter says here. He describes this salvation, first of all, as Christ having died for our sins once for all. He's not re-sacrificed regularly. There is a one-time sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ where he lays down his life. And he does it, as Peter describes, the just for the unjust. The just Christ, the, the sinless and spotless Savior, lays down his life for the unjust. That is, for the wicked, for the undeserving. So that, and here's the explanation here, why did Christ lay down his life for us? Why did he do it? So that he, Christ, might bring us to God. Why did he lay down his life? Why did he sacrifice? So that we can be brought into the presence of God. So that we can fellowship with God again. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, brings us to himself. This is really the uh, description of what is known as a substitutionary atonement. Christ becomes our substitute. Christ dies on our behalf. Christ, the innocent one, takes on the unrighteous punishment. The punishment deserving or deserved for the unrighteous. The innocent took the place of the guilty. Christ, the great exchange... The perfect God-man took the place of fallen man. This is then the marvelous truth of the gospel. This is what gives us hope. This is what gives us the ability to enter into the presence of God. The fact that Christ would lay down his life for us. It is really Good Friday, particularly the, the events that happened on the Thursday night, the final supper that Christ had with his disciples, where he finally exposed Judas as the one who would betray him. And ultimately, Judas then left that supper, went and found the Roman soldiers and told them where Jesus would be. That night, those final hours there that Jesus had with his disciples as he instructed them for the last time and communed with them for the last time. He then took them from the upper room out into the garden of Gethsemane to pray and to cast his burdens upon God and to ask ultimately, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. All of those events, as significant as they were, make sense because of what Christ was doing. From the outside, just the natural man, not understanding God's work, it would be a bit of a disappointment to see. It would be kind of shocking. It certainly was shocking to the apostles as they passed out when they were supposed to be praying. As they fled when the Roman soldiers came, they were shocked. It was surprising for them to understand what Christ was doing. But what was he doing? He was obeying the Father's will. He was moving towards the cross, preparing his heart to receive the wrath of God. Turn over to 2 Corinthians now. As Christ went to that cross, and as he fulfilled all that the Father had commanded him, he was heading ultimately to the cross to go through a mock trial, to be abused in that trial, and mocked by and have false witnesses come around. He bore up under all of those things, Ultimately being head taken to the cross so that, we, so that ultimately he would die on our behalf. You remember the story, of course, that Jesus Christ died. Three days later he was resurrected. He then, uh, shortly after that, ended up calling the Apostle Paul, some time after that, some years later, called the Apostle Paul to himself to have Paul go out and become a minister of the gospel. And Paul, in his preparation, spent time with Christ And we come to the book of 2 Corinthians, and Paul begins to defend his ministry to the Corinthians. And he starts to tell the Corinthians, this is why I'm here. I am here because I am a messenger of the new covenant. I am announcing the the gospel. 
And in chapter 5 here, he begins to defend himself. I just want to walk through this chapter because now we find really the heart and essence of his ministry as an apostle and basically a preacher of the gospel. Notice how he starts in, in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. And you say, what is he saying here? Well, basically, he says this. As he starts there, he says, you know, we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, he's referring to his earthly body. Referring to his earthly body as an earthly tent. If this body of mine should be torn down, we're anticipating, he says, or we're waiting for a building which is from God. We're waiting for our heavenly bodies. We have this earthly body, we're waiting for this heavenly body, this heavenly body that's made with hands that aren't human hands. We're looking for this eternal life to come where we will receive this heavenly body. And while we're in this earthly body, we groan for heaven. We long to be dwell, to dwell in that heavenly body. I mean, some of us can say, yes, I long for that. More than others. I mean, when you face illnesses, when you face difficulties, when you face the frailties of, of the human body, you recognize, I am glad, I will be glad when I'm done with this body and I have this heavenly one. This is Paul. And as he says, and as much as we having put it on, will not be found naked. Once we have this heavenly body, we are going to be found clothed before God. We groan, we anticipate, we wait for this. We were waiting for that time when the mortal will be swallowed up by life, when this frail human body will be taken away with all of its corruptions, with all of its lusts, with all of its failures, and we will be receiving our eternal body. Now from here, from verse 6 to the end, verse 21, six times Paul uses this word, therefore. Notice that you see that in verse 6. Therefore, based on what I just said about anticipating a heavenly body, I'm going to make another case, he says. Verse 11, he says it again. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone was in Christ, he's a new creature. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors on Christ's behalf. He builds this case. Now he's systematically increasing this case. What is he, what's the next step here? Well, the first step is this. Paul stands waiting for this day when he is going to be in his heavenly body. But until then, notice what he says, verse 6, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. He says, okay, here's my hope. I want to be in heaven, but I can't be right now. But that's okay. I'm not discouraged by that. I'm not discouraged by the fact that I can't be in heaven because right now I'm walking in faith before God. I'm not walking by sight. I'm walking in anticipation by faith. And so we have great courage. We'd rather... Be absent. We'd rather just be done with this all. We'd rather get rid of all the suffering, all the sorrows of earth, all the pain of this world. We'd rather have it all be done and we see Jesus face to face. I can tell you there are many mornings I've woken up saying, all right, Lord, today can be the day. I'm sure some of you have had those moments and experiences in life where you were ready to say, all right, Lord, today can be that day. We'll give you that time. In fact, even before breakfast, it's okay. Before the kids wake up, it would be even better. <laughs> Those moments when we would prefer to be in the presence of the Lord, especially when we face trials, especially, especially when we face suffering, especially when we face the limitations of the human frailty, human nature, we could say, oh Lord, I'd rather be in that heavenly tent. But notice verse 9. Therefore, 
we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Yes, we would rather be in the presence of the Lord. Yes, we'd rather be uh, before him, but we walk in encouragement. We walk in faith. We walk in anticipation, and we're ready for that. And on top of that, because we walk in faith, we, we strive to be pleasing to him wherever we're at. Whether we're here in the body or in heaven, we strive to be pleasing to him because we're all going to have to go before him. He's the impartial judge, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He is the one we will face. And so we live and we strive because we know we'll give an account to him. And all those worthless things we do will be burned up and the righteous things we do will be rewarded by the Lord. And so we wait and we strive. We seek to glorify him because that's our life. Verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord... We persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we have been made manifest also in your conscience. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. So let's just stop there for a second. He says, look, we're living... We're striving to proclaim the gospel. We're living in faith. We're living in courage, encouragement. We're living in hope. We're anticipating this time to come. We're striving to be obedient in everything. And as we do this, we live in the fear of God. We, we live to please him. We live to be manifested before him so that he would see our life. And we would be manifested not only before God, but we'd be manifested in you, that you would see us and you would take encouragement in us. Because you would see our good works and our love for God and you would be pleased and you would be encouraged in your own heart because you're not taking appearance uh, and pride in external appearances. You're taking joy in godliness. Verse 13, for if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. If we're of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, now notice this great truth. That one died for all, therefore all died. Now we start getting into the gospel. Now we start getting into the very heart of his work here. He says, I'm going around and I'm manifesting before all people the glory of God in me as I'm obedient to him. And I'm proclaiming to everyone the message of Christ. It is this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they, may, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We go and we proclaim the message of Christ. Christ controls us. He compels us to go out. And we proclaim the message of his death so that all those who live no longer live for themselves. They live for him. They live for the one who died for them them. They live for Christ who, who rose again for them. They live anticipating Christ's coming. Notice verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. He says, look, we no longer look for people to look at them in the flesh. We look for their transformed life. We look for the newness of life. How do we know that? Well, look, verse 17 tells us, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We have come, and we proclaim the gospel, and we watch for the gospel to transform somebody, and we start looking for that new man, that new work, that work of newness of life. This is now, verse 18, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Just stop there for a second. It says all of this work, everything that we're doing here is a, a work of God. As we proclaim this message, this message of reconciliation, this message of Jesus Christ, this message of his death, God is in the process of reconciling people to himself. 
God is in the process of making people new, giving them newness of life, setting them free in Christ to be new creatures. The old things have passed away, the old hindrances, the old stumbling blocks, the old man has died, new things have come in Christ Jesus. And God is in the process of working at drawing people to himself. Now notice verse 19. <clears throat> Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now this is, <clears throat> friends, an incredible encouragement. Because what Paul is saying here is that God has given to us this message that we go out and proclaim. And when we proclaim it, people are transformed. And when people are transformed, they're brought into union with God. And we get to be the ones to proclaim this message. We get to be the ones to proclaim that God was in Jesus reconciling the world to themselves. How? By not counting their trespasses against them. A righteous God, a holy God who cannot look upon evil, saw the sins of man and dealt with their sin problem. God seeking to reconcile sinner, sinners, God seeking to save us, God sending apostles and then sending his message to us that we would be able to understand it and go proclaim it. God was the one who initiated this reconciliation. He initiated it, first of all, by, of course, by sending Christ. He initiated it by calling the apostles who would come and teach the message. And then he initiated it as he brings people to salvation. He makes them new in Jesus Christ, verse 17. Now, the begging question is this. All right, if God's reconciling sinners, if he's bringing sinners to himself, and he is seeking to be reconciled with the whole world, but not counting their trespasses against them, the begging question is this. If God is holy and just, and if we're sin sinful and guilty, then how can this be possible without violating the character of God? How? How is this possible? And that's what verse 20 and 21 answers for us. How is it that God can be the just and the justifier? How can God be both merciful and just? How can he answer? How can he do this? And this is the doctrine of justification explained there in verse 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. That's the response. This is how God sends out ambassadors of Jesus Christ and he entreats us to come to, Christ, come to him through Jesus Christ. I love the phrases that he says here. He sends out ambassadors to speak. These ambassadors are not going out on their own behalf. They're going out on God's behalf. We go speak for God. We go to do his work. We go to proclaim his message. We go to proclaim his message to all people. We go to call people to turn away from where they were heading to God. We go to call people to turn to Christ. And here's the craziest idea of them all there in verse 20. In the second half of verse 20. It says, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you. You get the idea there? He's saying, as if God is in us begging you to turn. That's an amazing idea. As if somehow God himself is within us saying, turn sinner to the Savior. Paul says we go out like that. We go out and we preach the message of redemption, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, as if God is within us calling people to turn. And then the answer to the question, okay, God, how can you do this, is in verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
This is really the high point of justification. This is it. This is the answer. How can God be both just and the justifier? How can God be both perfectly holy and yet merciful to sinners? This is how. He, Jesus Christ, is made sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So that we were able to stand before God. In this one verse then, verse 21, is the whole gospel. When we come back on Sunday morning, we're going to learn these four things. We're going to learn that God is Savior, that Christ is our substitute, that we are sinners, and that righteousness saves. And that will be our outline for Sunday morning. So all of that was just a warm-up for Sunday. So let's prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's table. take this time as you come before the Lord to cast your sins upon him all the sins that you've committed lay them before him and seek forgiveness as 1 John says that if we confess our sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us all our transgressions And ask the men to come and pass the bread. final night as Christ pulling together his disciples his disciples throughout that day had prepared the meal, the final Passover meal that he'd eventually eat and in that preparation he had a, a room the upper room divinely prepared for as he said would be ready for him and he went, went up into that room and surrounded by all the apostles, you remember those final details. There was some bickering about who would be the greatest. There was a, an act of humility on the behalf of our Lord as he washed the feet of his disciples. At the same time, while they're arguing about who would be greater in the kingdom of heaven, 
And then there were the details, uh, the final events that Christ knew in his own heart and mind that while he was there, he was there to lay down his life. And they were unaware of the significance of those details. They could have probably remembered early on in that week, maybe the very first day when Christ entered into town and all the crowds were, were in a frenzy and, and crying out Hosanna and anticipating the glory of Christ. And maybe they were remembering in their mind the significance. Here, everybody loved him. Everyone appreciated him. They've heard that he had to lay down his life. They didn't register yet. But then maybe they remembered the various events throughout the week when Jesus confronted the Pharisees and challenged them and and cast out woes upon them. And maybe they're remembering when he went into the temple and he turned up the tables and maybe they're remembering some of the activities that week and the conflict that he had, they had. In their minds, they were swarming with all these details of the events that happened that week. And yet in Jesus' mind, he knows what's coming. He's about to lay down his life. And as he calls out to his disciples and and says, one of you is going to betray me, they all immediately start to wonder, who is it? And of course, they didn't all stand up and say, it's Judas. We we know it's him. They all started to wonder, is it me? Lord, am am I the one? They lean over, ask. John, ask him, "Who, who is it? John leans in and asks, and Jesus says, the one to whom I give this bread, he is the one who's going to betray me. And he gives it ultimately to Judas. Judas leaves. Judas is exposed. He's revealed. They were a bit shocked. You're the one who handled the money for all the disciples, the one who managed the money for their whole little band of followers. He's the betrayer. Um, Did someone check his checkbook? I mean... They're surprised. Christ is not surprised. He flees and then Christ turns to his disciples and says, now he initializes the new covenant. And beginning in this new covenant, he says, this is the bread, this bread is my body. I lay it down on behalf of you. When you take of it, eat and remember of me. Let's take of this bread and remember Christ and his death. His life lay down for us. Lord, we know it was no small thing for you to lay down your life. We know the struggle even when we have to deny ourselves, when we resist sin, we know how hard it is to deny our desires. We know how hard it is to de- deny our wants. And especially when we have to do something that would cause us great harm, we know how hard it is. We know how hard, because it is within our natural nature to want to protect ourselves, to want to stay alive, to fight for life. And yet you knew at this very moment you were about to lay down your life for us. You were about to sacrifice yourself as you gave your whole life And when we take of this bread, we're reminded that you bore all of our infirmities. That you lived here on earth as a man. You had a body like we have a body. You suffer just like we suffer. You experience pain and joy just as we experience pain and joy. You know what hunger is. You know what sorrow is. You know what tiredness is. You know the frailties we go through. And so as we take of this bread and remembering that you are the bread of life, we take it remembering that you know our weaknesses and our difficulties and our sufferings and that you can relate to us. And as such, then, you can be the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you for all this work. It's in Christ's name we pray. This moment, the men are going to come and pass the cup.
So when he turned to the cup, he said those words that says, This cup is my blood shed. It's the cup that symbolized the new covenant. It is in the Old Testament in Leviticus, it says, By shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. When we come to the new covenant, Christ is saying to his disciples at this time, this covenant represents my blood, it represents my sacrifice. Again, at the moment, it had to be odd to them to hear that. This was Christ sitting in their presence. They were becoming aware, maybe more, that he is ultimately going to die here soon. You remember even earlier, uh, Peter said, Lord, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going to let you die. And Peter took with him a sword. He was going to be prepared to stand up and to fight anyone that would come. He, in his own mind, thought this was not going to happen, and Christ knew it was going to happen. And so as he took of this cup and passed it among his disciples, he knew the events that were coming next. He knew just in a few short hours, he would be in the middle of the garden praying to his father, begging his father for all of this to pass, and he knew the father would have him walk through this. He knew the soldiers would come in and into the garden and arrest him. He knew that Judas himself would come and betray him with a kiss. He knew even that night he would head out to a mock court that met in the middle of the night when they weren't supposed to meet in the middle of the night and to find false witnesses who would come and accuse him of things as they tried to come up with something to accuse him with. He knew, of course, the next morning when he would finally be handed over to Pilate that ultimately he would also suffer another mock trial. He would ultimately face his death. He knew all of those things. But as he passed this cup to his disciples, they didn't know those details. They just recognized this is something new. This is a different way of handling the Passover Seder. This is something more significant as he says this is the new covenant. When we take of this, we take of this after the cross. We take looking back and knowing all the significance of every one of those steps. We take this cup remembering exactly what Christ has done. That he laid down his life. Shed his blood. Gave himself as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And we take this recognizing we needed it. Because without it, God couldn't be justified. And without it, we couldn't stand before him. So we take this, knowing that God was satisfied in laying his wrath fully upon the Son, and the Son bore the wrath of God on our behalf. Take this in remembrance of Christ. Lord, we couldn't even fathom the grief and the agony you experienced on the cross. Well, we can imagine death, and we can imagine the suffering of death, we can imagine the, the effects of death, but we cannot imagine God, very God, the second member of the Trinity, being separated from the Father. We couldn't imagine the grief that you experienced at that moment when you cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? We couldn't imagine the horror. We couldn't imagine the suffering in those final hours. We couldn't imagine the mockery of your own creation, whom you formed with your own hand, who you destined from eternity past and brought together. We couldn't imagine the agony you experienced at that moment as they turned on you to exalt themselves. Men who instead of honoring The Father honored themselves. Men who should have been there to lift your name up were there to lift themselves up. We couldn't imagine the agony you faced in those moments as you died and lay down your life and breathed your last. Breathed it knowing that you were being separated from the Father. But you did. You bore that for us. And so we thank you And we rejoice that we come to this season reminded that you did lay down your life and reminded 
that you will and are victorious. That even at this moment, as you sit at the right hand of the Father, you remember the glory of those particular events. And it is what gives us hope. We just pray even tonight as we reflect on these things that we would find hope in your work, find hope in you alone, that we would rejoice that we are your children, and then that we would go out being your ambassadors. Thank you for this work. Thank you for this message of salvation. Thank you for the hope that we have in your name. Now make us bold for your glory's sake. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll stand. I'm going to have one closing song together before we head home.
remind you that uh, Sunday morning we'll have two services, an 8.30 service and a 10.30 service. You can come listen to both sermons if you want. They'll be the same thing twice, but we're going to go through again 2 Corinthians 5.21 and see the glory of the gospel. I pray that you enjoy your time with your family this weekend, preparing your hearts for Sunday. Let me just close us in a final word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for everything you've given us. Thank you for the joy to come together as your people and to rejoice in the work of Christ. Thank you for giving us the hope of salvation. Thank you for accomplishing what we could not possibly have accomplished on our own. And thank you ultimately for giving us hope. As we leave this place, we leave not only with the hope that our sins are covered, but even with the joy of knowing we have been reconciled with God. We are children, children of the Most High, We are sons and daughters of God. So as we go out, we go out proclaiming your message to all that they too can have what we have in Christ Jesus because we worship a God who seeks sinners. Thank you for this. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.